It is now my honor to introduce Paul Brown, co-founder and chief executive officer of Inspire Brands. Inspire Brands is a multi-brand restaurant company whose portfolio includes more than 11,000 brands worldwide, including Arby's, Buffalo Wild Wings, Sonic Drive-In, Rusty Taco, and Jimmy John's. Prior to founding Inspire, he was the CEO of Arby's Restaurant Group and launched several transformation activities, including the brand's global system with a focus on innovation, including new brand purpose, inspiring smiles through delicious experiences, unveiling a visionary restaurant design that increases energy and efficiency. Paul is also an alumnus of Georgia Tech. Please welcome Paul Brown. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be here at this great conference, and I'm really looking forward to talking about the exciting journey the restaurant industry is on, uh, facilitated by technology and what's happening with Inspire as part of that. Um, but given the fact that it is this group, I thought I would start by telling a story I've never told before, a personal story that is a bit embarrassing. Uh, semi-related to technology and is clearly going to disqualify me from ever being a member of the society, ever. So uh, I graduated Georgia Tech, uh, and it's a 30-year-old story, so I'm going to really date myself uh, as I talk about this. So 30 years ago, my first job out of Georgia Tech was actually coded. Uh, and I was a consultant uh, on a very large project to a client that I won't name. Let's just say that it is a Atlanta-based company that flies a lot of people around the world. And we were on a very large project, systems integration project. And we were using uh, some very dated technologies. They were then, so COBOL, how many people? COBOL, CICS, and SQL, right? Uh, and I was actually, I would call you a combination of a fairly innovative, very lazy programmer. For those of you that ever used COBOL, you do have to type a lot. Everything is just really long commands. Every time you actually wanted to store something, you had to actually reserve space to store it. It was just a lot of work. SQL, on the other hand, I loved. It was wonderful. You could write these very long statements. And I realized very early on that you could do embedded queries. And the more you embedded in one single query in SQL, the less you had to type in COBOL to actually save the variable off and use it in the next query. And so I got incredibly good. I was the king of SQL, SQL and embedded you know, queries. And so I became quite efficient in writing this code, which was fairly complicated, a lot of, a lot of things that needed to happen in there. And I, I, but doing it in a way that I thought was actually the most efficient way of doing it. The challenge came when the performance test came around. And we were operating on an IBM 3090, again, dating myself. And the challenge is it had 128 megabytes of central storage. So when you started running through a lot of data through and the SQL was actually doing the queries, it actually kind of bogged things down. And so this program that I wrote that was supposed to run in a couple of hours overnight batch, of course, of actually ended up running initially for a couple of months, right, to get through the data. So that was a, a, a problem. Uh, and so that was the first problem. So I did some adjustments, made some adjustments, and got it down to maybe running in about four weeks. So I was trying to figure out how to solve this problem. I thought, hey, well, the 3090 actually has six CPUs. So what if I actually fragmented the code into six fragments and fragmented the data set into it and actually got it running simultaneously on all six CPUs? Now, of course, you're probably doing the math and realizing that that's still not going to solve my problem if it's running in a month and I divide it by six, that still doesn't get you there. But it was still kind of, it was a pretty cool solution, actually, I thought. So I started doing that and got it running the first time. It was really exciting, and I was watching it. It took on one CPU, then the other, and I'm sitting there. Of course, you have to click to refresh the screen every time. And it started going six CPU, all six CPUs. I said, this is really exciting. This is amazing. And then I noticed that it started pegging at 100% on the first one, and then 100% on the second one. 
And then 100% on the third one, I started hearing people around me going, are you guys having any problems going on here? It seems to be there's a, a bit of an issue, everything's slowing down. And I'm sitting there going, I, I need to hit the cancel button. I couldn't cancel. So it completely consumed everything on this. I found out later there were some production systems on there too, on this 30, 3090. So I'm sitting there panicking and the phone next to me rings and says, you know, are you user PB3456? And I said, Yes, um, so they had to do a hard start uh, on the 3090, which is not a very easy thing to do. Brought down a few things, including the entire project for about seven hours. Uh, and I learned the hard way that maybe this is not the right way to do it. I since learned that one of the issues is that in the date stream, I happened to put dates that ended in 00, zero uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the date stream, uh, which is part of it. And so I realized that as much as I enjoy coding, this was not gonna be the profession for me. Uh, so I did what anyone in this circumstance would do is I went to business school uh, and went on a completely different track. But you know, I tell that story because I spent several years and appreciated, obviously, technology, even though I wasn't particularly good at it. But because of that, out of business school, my first project that they put me in was in, it was in 1994, dating myself, working for another airline, another part of the country, answering this question, this internet thing, how is it going to change the way we do business. And I got to be part of a lot of that happening in the airline industry, and then went on to the hotel industry and saw that transformation there, and actually became a little bit of a student around how technology can fundamentally transform an industry end to end as it goes in. So looking at that, now let's talk about the, 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 era of the restaurant industry. One way that you can look at the productivity of an industry. It's one way, but it's one way to look at the productivity of an industry is labor productivity as measured by the government, which is the ratio of labor in to outputs coming out, right? And as an industry tends to become more, more efficient, uh, you see actually the productivity curve increase. And so what I'm gonna show you here is a few charts comparing certain industries going back to 1987, all indexed to 100%. And you can see the impact of technology. So first I'll show you is the banking industry. Banking, you see, actually was accelerating already because it got a head start. ATMs came out in the 60s, actually started rolling out in the 70s, uh, quite a bit in the 80s, and that change transformed it. And you can see how that productivity is fundamentally improved. Retail. Again, Amazon was founded in 1994. Uh, E-commerce started coming in. You see how it started kinking and then has fundamentally transformed. Interesting to see the last couple of years, particularly driven by the fundamental adoption of e-commerce actually through COVID was a part of that reason. But you see the, the, the retail industry. Airlines. Interestingly enough, you see airlines, that curve starts to kink around 1996, 1997, 98. That's when Expedia, Travelocity were founded in 96, 98. You actually saw e-tickets and all the innovation going on there. And you see how that has been a fundamental transformation uh, of, of that industry. Hotels, given the fact it's brick and mortar, not as much, but you also see that it has improved in productivity significantly. So what about the restaurant industry? flat. Restaurant industry, in my belief, is the last really large industry, $600 billion industry in the United States, $2 trillion industry around the world that has yet to be fundamentally, fundamentally transformed by technology. We're still at the really, really early stages, which is what's so exciting. And you can ask why, why hasn't it? Well, it's an industry that has been built really off a lot of manual processes. 700,000 individual manufacturing and retail units around the United States, 15 million of those around the world. Not particularly easy to automate technology vendors, not until recently, we're not particularly focused in big ways on the, on, on the, on the restaurant industry. And so the, uh, the, the, it has not been fundamentally transformed. Another reason is it is a highly, highly fragmented industry. $600 billion in the United States, but very, very few large companies. And anyone in this room, everybody in this room has been involved in one shape or form and where technology transformation is occurring, a couple of things are true. One, it's very, very expensive. 
right? And particularly when an industry is actually moving from not adopting technology to adopting it, it's a huge transition in capability set. You have to have entirely different people working for the organization. Um, it takes a vision, it takes patience, and that is very difficult to do unless you are all at a certain level. And so we were looking at this and saying it's a highly fragmented industry that is ripe for transformation. A lot of forces are coming into it, facilitated by technology, and companies need to actually think differently and have the ability to make these large investments to be able to actually be competitive even though consolidation is going on around them you're seeing, uh, with third-party delivery companies, et cetera, uh, attracting talent, having people come work in the restaurant industry that may have never considered that as a profession before, and then obviously being able to do this while still showing near-term results and continuing to improve organizational efficiencies. So that's kind of the landscape, and we were looking at that back in 2014, 2015, saying that there is a real opportunity here. There is a real opportunity for a company to come in and actually create a different kind of restaurant company, consolidate already successful restaurant brands, but actually build a platform, technology platform, capabilities platform, designed in such a way that it is not only scalable, but it's highly extensible, that each of the individual businesses can actually benefit from the investments being made by any of the other businesses and the core capabilities that actually matter in the restaurant industry. And that's what ended up being the foundation of Inspire Brands. And today, just a little bit about Inspire Brands, you heard a little bit of the introduction that we now have of uh, six brands uh, across uh, the various spectrums. Uh, we just completed the Duncan Brands acquisition uh, during COVID in 2020. And in a very short period of time, we've gone from Arby's buying Buffalo Wild Wings to then acquiring Sonic just a few months later to merging with Jimmy John's. And then, as I just said, Dunkin' Donuts uh, and Baskin Robbins coming as part of the portfolio, making us, I'll get to that in a minute, the second largest restaurant company uh, in the US. But it's not just the second largest company in the US. We have 30 billion in system sales, uh, 32,000 restaurants in 70 countries. Uh, and really importantly, I'll get to this in a minute, $7 billion of, of digital sales with 650,000 people working in our restaurants. But it's not just about being big and putting together a portfolio. The key here is what's the culture that we're trying to put around this, a culture that will allow for the type of innovation, the type of business model changes that need to happen because it's not just about the creation of technology, as you know, but it's actually how do you get the end-to-end -end organization, 650,000 people actually thinking and acting differently. And so we've really even thought about that in our core behaviors. Our core behaviors or our values are first and foremost mavericks. We actually like to think about, are we doing things that no one has ever done before in the restaurant industry or coming about a completely different way of thinking about it? Allies, and those two are very important because you don't want individual mavericks running off doing crazy things. You actually want it to be working together collaboratively. And how are we actually doing things that work for our franchisees, that work for our, our, our customers, that also work for our team members as well. Visionaries, achievers, and of course, uh, good citizens. But it's again, it's in more than just the culture. We had to think about, okay, if we're going to invest, if we're actually going to invest in core capabilities, what are the ones that are going to actually make the biggest difference in the performance of the organization? What are the things that if we are better than anyone else in the restaurant industry, and in many of these, our bar is actually at being better than anyone else ultimately in, in the consumer business, the consumer sector, that we will actually win versus our competitors and be the one that is defining the journey uh, versus being defined by it. And these are the ones that we went through and said, these are the eight core capabilities that we are going to invest in outsized with the aspiration of actually being better than anyone else. And if you see that technology underpins all of these, some of these fundamentally underpins that and others actually are a big supporting function. And we've been investing in this for the past several years. And that's caused us to go from our headquarters, if you look at our headquarters, almost 50% of the people in our corporate headquarters 
are either technology, data, analytics people. Right? It doesn't sound like a restaurant company. It actually sounds more like a technology company. But when you think about technology, so a lot of people say, okay, technology in the restaurant industry, I get it. Uh, you can actually order online. It, you know, think they're, they're, that's already kind of rolled out. It's really fund more fundamental than that. So if you go back just 10 years in the restaurant industry, um, the relationship with your customer started when they walked physically into the restaurant or were sitting in the car in the drive-thru. And the relationship ended the moment they drove off the property. Didn't know who they were, didn't know anything about them, couldn't talk to them in between that. There was no linkage between that. And you think about that, it meant that you couldn't dynamically price to them. You couldn't actually, you had to rely on historical, more traditional marketing channels like television because that was the only way you could actually reach them. You couldn't actually use that data to fundamentally uh, improve the operations of the organization because of the, what that data allows you to do and understand and plan for and forecast. You couldn't use it very effectively in actually the supply chain. In 10 years, we've gone from almost 0% digital to now the industry's running about 25% digital. And that enables a lot of things, not just on reaching the guest, but even more excitingly in many cases, improving the efficiency of the operations by how you use all that together. Uh, and this journey has only been accelerated by COVID. In fact, if you look at Inspire, the number of digital sales for Inspire has gone up 91% since the first quarter of 2020 to the first quarter of 2022. All of these trends were just fundamentally accelerated uh, and made more exciting. So what I thought I'd do is just walk you through just a couple of examples of how we're actually utilizing technology uh, for starting probably on the farthest edge of the reaching the guest and then some examples too of how we're actually using it to improve and fundamentally transform the efficiency of the organization. So the first I'll use is at Sonic. Uh, we were excited about Sonic when we bought it in 2018. A lot of people look at Sonic. How many people are familiar? There's not as many around this area. We're working on that, I promise. There's more coming. But a lot of people looked at Sonic and said, it's just an old school drive-in concept, right? Is that great, you know, it's a model that's on its way out because you go, you park, you press a button, you talk to somebody, they bring out the food. What we saw is it's a model that is perfectly designed for an order ahead mobile environment because you can go in and seamlessly integrate the experience. If somebody actually orders on their phone or their app, then they come on property, it can, very into, it can integrate seamlessly into that overall experience uh, and it becomes very multi-channel. And we also, the labor of bringing the, the, uh, the food out to the car, the curbside side of it, which you hear a lot of restaurants trying to do curbside service today, is already fundamentally built into that model. And that's allowed the, or the Sonic to go in a three and a half year period from 0% digital sales to a billion dollars in digital sales uh, by actually integrating that seamlessly into the experience. And that's really what's interesting and fascinating about this industry. It's not just a one dimensional throw up, a ordering device, et cetera. It actually allows for some real multi-channel, fundamentally changing the entire experience end to end by integrating technology in it in a way that is actually good for them, very positive for the guest, but at the same time, also incredibly positive for the business model. Another example of, of where we're innovating it uh, is in Buffalo Wild Wings. Buffalo Wild Wings has pre-COVID 75% dine-in, 100% of that was actually server facilitated, right? So traditional, go to the table, we'll wait for the server, server will come, you pick up a printed menu, you do the order, they go away, they bring you the food, they come back and you sit there and wait forever to pay, right? That's the traditional experience, right? Very labor intensive and also pretty frustrating in some cases for uh, the customer, but also uh, very static when it comes to a pricing situation, right? You have every two, um, twice a year, you print the menu, those are your prices, those are your menu prices every single time of the day, every single day of the week, no matter what. So we're working on, by the end of the year, rolling out a model which is transforming that to where at any point in the experience, the customer can choose how they want to integrate. If they want to come in and order from the server, 
but then reorder from their app or pay on their app or actually pay the server or any combination of that, right? We actually can facilitate that in a very seamless way, which is actually very, very consumer friendly, but as I said, actually allows us to transform the labor model, the serving model, but also allows us to think more dynamically about how we price at lunch when there's not a lot of people at a Buffalo Wild Wings versus potentially pricing in the middle of the Super Bowl when it's pretty packed, right? And, and the dynamic of it and get out of that whole mode. And it really is incredibly transformative to the end-to-end -end business model. And then at Dunkin' and a lot of our drive throughs this is where there's a tremendous amount of innovation going and so excited about what the teams are doing there. Where we're looking at every element of the drive through experience around automating that or actually facilitating that. So for example, someone orders on the app and as they're driving up into, we can geocode as they're driving up to the building, we actually can say if they turn left coming into the parking lot, we know they're gonna go in and get their food, so drop the order there so it's ready for them when they walk in the building. If they turn right, we know they're going into the drive-through. We know where they are in the drive-through. So when they come up to the window, we're handing them the order out the window. We're handing them the order and saying thank you, right? Fully integrated into the experience. So again, very much letting them choose how they wanna do it and facilitating that. Again, making it a lot easier for the people in the restaurants, but also better for those, uh, for the customers as well. But also looking at how we schedule and look at the analytics side of it and how we can get better about serving our customers and actually planning using labor. So last example, next to last example is Buffalo Wild Wings. Buffalo Wild Wings is a notoriously difficult brand to predict. Year over year is a horrible predictor of sales, particularly at a unit level. The team that was playing the home game last year may be away. They might have been winning last year, losing this year, high school, weather, all these components that actually are very difficult, particularly if you want to get down to day increments and 15-minute increments. So part of what we've been using is AI to learn and be better at predicting sales all the way into 15-minute increments by item that we're going to sell by part of the restaurant that is going to allow us to do that. So what that lets us do is fundamentally think differently about how we actually plan and schedule labor. Here's an interesting example. Pre all of this, before we bought the business, the way that labor was allocated or, uh, was to a restaurant was just by the dollar sales volume of that restaurant at a week. So if it did $14,000 uh, 14, 14, a, a week, uh, it would actually get the same amount of labor to same restaurants, whether they were actually very bar heavy, whether they're in different parts of the country, depending, on, it, it, did it matter? And so what we were able to do is actually get so predictive down to the level and the types of the restaurants. And by the way, this is what that we used to get. So those two restaurants, you see, they're quite different. One's very bar heavy, one's actually very food heavy. They get the same amount of labor, same amount of bartender staff, the same amount of server staff, same amount of cooks. Uh, no matter what. So after doing this, you see that we can fundamentally change it. One restaurant, it's not all about taking it out. In fact, one of the restaurants, we were starving in of labor. We were actually losing sales because we actually didn't have enough bartenders there, et cetera. The other one, we may have been just a little bit heavy. And that's a fundamental transformation, allowing we have the right people in the right place at the right time that actually really allows for us to actually get the revenue po possibility of that restaurant as well, and it has been very transformative of us. Clearly, there's been a change management agenda on this where, where uh, the general manager was make their own decisions around when they staffed, et cetera. So actually letting the tool run and letting the machine tell the, the team has actually been a very difficult part of the transformation, um, but it's really been a, a big journey for us. The last thing I'll show you is people say, what about automation in the restaurants? Is it possible to use robotics and other things to fundamentally innovate and run in the restaurants? And the answer is to a certain extent. So one of the challenges, we have 32,000 of them. So you, you, know, you can only put so much automation in 32,000 locations. And then some of the jobs are actually not particularly automatable. But one of them is, is the fry station. And I'll show you here. The fry station is not, it's not the first job that somebody shows up and says, please put me at the fly station because I really like standing over this thing all day long uh, and moving baskets around and getting. So it is a perfect example of where we're able to potentially use automation, not only to actually reduce the, uh, and reallocate that job somewhere else, but also make it a more friendly environment 
Uh, and so this is just a, a quick video, two second video showing of how we're implementing this uh, in one of the Buffalo Wild Wings. Me, Flippy. Inspire Brands, which owns Buffalo Wild Wings, is testing out the Flippy 2 robot, which will make wings in the back of house over the next year. And there's a lot of op opportunity to do that, particularly if you start thinking about up into the supply chain and fundamental transformation there. So I, ho I hope you see that this, I, I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm loving what's happening in this industry. I've worked in the hotel industry, the airline industry. I've worked for Expedia. I've been all over those types of industries, but never have I actually been uh, on this kind of a journey, this relatively early in the stage in an industry that has so many opportunities end to end to actually fundamentally transform every single element of the business uh, in a win-win environment where it's actually good for the customers, it's also good for the business model, and it's also good for the team members as well. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to come up here and talk a little bit about the restaurant and Inspire Industry journey. Hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.